Characters in movies and TV shows almost always get a mouthful of gasoline whenever they're siphoning from one tank to another. So in this fluid mechanics video, I'm going to show you a much smarter way to siphon that doesn't require sucking at all. And I'm going to tie this into the Bernoulli equation and the continuity equation, which are the two main principles that help analyze siphons. And finally, we'll wrap it up with some calculations about finding the maximum height for a siphon, as well as the maximum volumetric flow rate that you can get out of a siphon. I was thinking that I was going to be a little bit quiet during filming this video. You can see that Indiana is up here sleeping right now. But he actually chewed up my experiment a little bit earlier, and that's why he's so tired right now. So I'll be as loud as I want. I'm Dr. Bernard, engineering professor. So let's start off by talking about how a siphon works. In order to start a siphon, you need to get water into the tube such that there's enough water in the siphon that it is below the initial height of the source you are siphoning from. And once that achieves, you don't have to do anything. The water will keep flowing until water in the large tank gets down below point B. Now why this happens is actually very contentious among scientific circles. I think my favorite story about an explanation as to why siphons work happened about 10 years ago when a professor was mad at the dictionary that they said that siphons were due to atmospheric pressure. And he submitted a journal article that disproved this theory and posed another theory. And then of course a year later, some other scientist disproved his theory with a new journal article. And essentially that's how the academic research goes. Somebody publishes a paper that said, this is how siphons work. And then somebody else comes up with a different design of a siphon that works in a different way than that. In the end, the dictionary didn't replace their definition with the one proposed uh, by the scientist. Instead, they just took out the part about being caused by pressure. So siphoning now is just a way to move water from a high place to a low place under its own power. So I'm gonna give an explanation here that's a little bit different than ones you might find in other videos, but I think might be a good way to to sort of explain it. So essentially there's four things that could happen from this point on the drawing. Either all the water could stay exactly where it is, or all the water could get sucked back to the big tank, all the water could get sucked down to the lower tank, or the water could separate and go in two different directions. So let's look at that last one first, because I think that might be some people's initial intuition would be that from the top here, we'd get some water falling down to the left, and then the water on the right would just fall down to the right. And a way to understand why that would not happen is to think of what would be left up there at the top. So if the water separated and some went left and some went right, then there would be a void in the middle. And think about pressure, that place would be at a vacuum. And you would then have atmospheric pressure pushing up from the left and atmospheric pressure pushing up from the right, and it would reclose the gap that is formed. So as to why it wouldn't just stay exactly where it is, it's because the system's not in equilibrium, right? The liquid on the left-hand side is being supported by the walls and bottom of the tank, and the liquid in a lot of the tube is being supported by the tube itself, but there's quite a lot of liquid over on the right-hand side that is not being supported and wants to fall. And to answer then which direction, whether it will continue to the right or get pulled back to the left, think back to the second law of thermodynamics if you've already taken that course. One version of the second law of thermodynamics explains the directionality of processes that is that processes will proceed in the direction towards a lower potential energy. As we look at the siphon overall, consider where the center of mass would be. It would be probably somewhere right in the middle of the large tank on the left. If the siphoning is working to the right, we are taking mass from the top of the water, it's going through the tube, and then it's filling in this space right here, and that's resulting in an overall drop in elevation, which is going to a lower state of gravitational potential energy. If this were reversed, we'd be taking water from the right-hand side, reversing back through, and then pushing up to the top of the tank, which would result in an increase in gravitational potential energy. And that's why it's essential that to start a siphon, you need water that is past the elevation of the starting tank. Because then at that point, you're taking water from the top of the tank and moving it to the lower elevation at the bottom of the siphon, which is essentially just like water rolling downhill. And that's why it proceeds forward instead of getting sucked back in the opposite direction. In this short clip, my TA Indiana is helping me demonstrate that in order to start a siphon, you just need to be just a tiny bit below the elevation of the initial tank in order to start flow. Thanks, Indy, you are a big help. One of the drawbacks in that last clip was that since only a small amount of the hose was inserted into the tank, it only emptied part way. If you wanted to get all of the fluid out of a tank, instead you would actually need to start off with a lot more liquid in your siphon. And so one way you can do that is in steps, by first inserting part of your siphon, covering up the end, removing it, and then covering it back up again and inserting it a second time. And so if your siphon is much longer, this lets you get enough that it'll still get over the U-bend and just below the height of the initial tank. So this is the part that 
that everybody gets wrong in the movies. They think that you have to suck to create a vacuum to get liquid into the tube. Not true at all. You just insert the tube into the liquid and then you can close off the end and with the end sealed, no air can get in and the liquid won't fall out of the tube as you reposition. Indy, you are blocking everybody's view. Get out of the way. So no mouthful of gasoline like Jonas has in Netflix is dark or then in The Simpsons, Otto get when he used the principal's credit card to get more gasoline. All right, so how's all this applied to Bernoulli's equation? So I have the head form of Bernoulli's equation on the screen right now. And this is a version where all terms are in units of length or height. And when using Bernoulli's equation, you're always gonna use it to compare two points to each other. And it's always gonna be easiest if you can compare two points that have something in common. So in order to solve any sort of problem to deal with the siphon, we're gonna either compare points A and D because they're at the same pressure as each other, they're both at open to the atmosphere, or we'll compare points B, C, and D, which are gonna have the same velocity as each other. And that's where the continuity continuity equation comes in. So the continuity equation is essentially a version of the conservation of mass. It says that the same mass entering a control volume has to equal the same mass exiting, as long as there's no accumulation. So for the mass flow rate to be the same, as long as the fluid has the same density at both ends, and as long as both ends have the same cross-sectional area, then you get the same velocity. So that's why for a constant diameter hose, you'll get the same velocity at all three points along the hose. So let's look at what happens when we compare points A to D. So since they're both at atmospheric pressure, the pressure terms are gonna cancel out. And if we assume that the tank at A is moving very slowly, that it's a very wide tank, we can assume that that velocity is approximately zero. And we can define our datum such that the height at point two is equal to zero. And then between points A and D, this essentially becomes a potential to kinetic energy trade-off. You get the gravitational potential energy at point A becomes kinetic energy in the form of velocity at point D. And the H under this square root sign would actually refer to H2, that difference in height between A and D. And so now let's compare point C to point D. So they'd be at the same velocity since they're both within the same tube with the same cross-sectional area and density, so those terms cancel out. And we can call H2 equals zero by placing our datum there. And we know that P2 is open to the atmosphere, so this would be atmospheric pressure. So then as long as height one is known, we'll be able to solve for P1. And on my equation here, I call this H1, but really on the drawing, this is actually referring to height three, the change in height between point C and point D. And then rearranging those terms, you get the manometer equation. Last thing on the drawing before we get into a short numerical example is gonna be where this course is gonna go in the rest of the semester. Because we're making some assumptions in this problem that aren't necessarily justified. And the main assumption is head loss. We're ignoring friction. So in later chapters of this book, when you get to conduit flow, you'll find out about friction losses due to flow through pipes. And when you get there, you get to use the Moody chart and Reynolds number and all sorts of fun toys in order to figure out that there's actually going to be energy losses due to this entrance. There's going to be energy losses due to the exit. There'll be energy losses due to this 180 degree bend. And then you'll also have energy losses just due to the length of flow that's going to be based on the smoothness of the pipe. So for today, we're looking at really maximum perfect condition cases when I solve for velocity and height terms. If you want to come back to this problem in a few weeks and include these losses, you'll find more realistic values of what you could actually get in a real experiment. Given that you're trying to siphon ethanol, which has nearly the same properties as gasoline, seeing as it's mixed in with gasoline, try to find the maximum volumetric flow rate you can get out of your siphon, as well as the maximum height that your siphon can be above your output tank. So we'll start off by finding volumetric flow rate first. And to find that, we're gonna need velocity at point D, which we'll get by comparing to point A. So as a reminder from the discussion earlier, they're both at the same pressure, atmospheric, so that term cancels out, and I'll call my datum at height two equal to zero. I'm also gonna call the velocity at point A equal to zero as well, since it's assumed to be a larger tank. And now at this point, I'm stuck. I can't actually get the velocity until I know the change in height. So I'm gonna switch over to finding the maximum height first and then come back to velocity later. So looking at Bernoulli's equation from C to D, we're saying that they are at the same velocity and I'm calling point D zero as far as uh, elevation. And that gets us back to the manometer equation. And I can rearrange the manometer equation in order to find height. So one thing we haven't talked about yet is this pressure at point C. In order to find the maximum height of a manometer, you need to know the minimum pressure that you're allowed to have at the, at the maximum height. And that's gonna be the saturation pressure for the liquid. 
So rearranging the manometer equation to solve for height, you may notice here that I wrote in a term 5333 that I haven't introduced yet, and that is PSAT, the saturation pressure for the fluid being siphoned. So it's extremely important for a siphon to work for it to be entirely a liquid. If there are any bubbles on the inside, it's possible for the siphon effect to break. And so these maximum height and maximum velocities are gonna be driven by the saturation pressure of the fluid. At the very tallest height, you're giving up pressure in order to gain height which means that at the very top, you're gonna to be at the very minimum pressure. And so that minimum pressure at the very top of the siphon is gonna be the saturation pressure. And for most liquids, this is gonna be a very low pressure. So atmospheric pressure is about 101 kPa and saturation pressure for ethanol is actually around 5 kPa. Although this does vary quite a bit by temperature, I used a value that I looked up that was around 20 degrees Celsius. So for ethanol, we get a maximum height of a little bit over 12 meters. And from looking at this equation, you can see that density is in the denominator of this expression. You may be able to predict that the maximum height for a water siphon is actually going to be a little bit smaller than this. It's usually in the ballpark of about 10 meters. So I plugged in that number then for velocity, found a little over 15 meters per second. Plugging everything into the volumetric flow rate equation, 0.001 one meters cubed per second, which is not the most useful unit when siphoning. It's maybe more useful to compare that to liters per second, so 1.2 liters per second. And some quick math, if you wanted to siphon five gallons of gas would take you about 16 seconds, which is actually pretty quick. Although keep in mind, this requires building a 12 meter tall siphon, which means you probably have to siphon over a, a highway overpass or something to get that kind of height difference. Or maybe be siphoning from a car on the second or third story of a parking garage. So let's quickly see what those numbers would be for a more realistic height if you were just going from like a gas tank down to the ground right below it, a height that's about 0.5 meters. So when we went from 12 meters down to 0.5 meters, that was a change of about 24 times shorter and the time got about five times longer. So this is not a coincidence that five squared is 25, which is about the same ratio. Because of that square root sign in the velocity part of the equation, in order to double the throughput, you need four times as much height. So this is why 25 times shorter would lead to five times slower to fill the tank. As a final zombie apocalypse siphoning checklist, one, in order to fill up a tank the fastest, you need to be as tall as possible. And that height is measured from the discharge end from the tank you're siphoning from. Two, although you're limited on that maximum height based on the liquid that you're siphoning, for gasoline, it's around 12 meters. So, and lastly, you do not need to actually create a vacuum by sucking on the tube to start it flowing. You just need to start with a tube that already has some gasoline in it. And the easiest way to do this is by putting your tube all the way into the tank and then covering the end and pulling some of it out. And of course, also keep in mind that almost none of this will actually work on modern cars. Almost all cars nowadays have an anti-siphoning valve built into the fuel tank so that you can't just insert a hose into them. So this trick would really only work when siphoning from large tanks that don't have those sort of safety precautions. If you do want to siphon from a modern car, you'll just need something that's actually much more specialized. Basically, it needs to be a very small, hard tube in order to fit kind of around the ball valve that's on the inside of your fuel tank. If you think this tip will help you live a day or two longer in the zombie apocalypse, go ahead and hit the thumbs up button below this video and consider subscribing to my channel so you can see each new video as they come out. If you want to watch another video right now, you'll see some links on the screen. Click on any one you want. They're probably not zombie apocalypse related, but I guess you never really do know. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.